Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. Does anyone have a testimony they'd like to share before I get started? I'd like to thank the Lord today for his mercy and his grace that was extended to me through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, who died Amen. on the cross for my sins. I wish Beth and uh, myself and my sister Jill were standing right over there. Brother Marvin led us to the Lord. Yep. And I'm so thankful for that today. Thankful Amen. for this church. And thankful, to, thankful, most of all, to Jesus Christ who died for my sins. Amen. 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 I'd like to thank God for all the things that he took away from me and all the things he replaced them with. I was talking to my best friend, Jim, back there. We've been best friends for 56, 57 years. And I'm glad he and his daughter are here today. We were talking about sacrifice last night around the fire and realized that God sacrificed the best that he had for us. And... kind of stuck in my mind and just wanted to share that and just like to thank God for all the good things he's put in my life I want to thank the Lord for holding me up through the loss that we've suffered but it's such a great yes. comfort to know where Cash and Lee are Amen. It's, thank you Lord for that assurance from your spirit and from your book. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank the Lord for saving me, giving my daughter Lori. She's yes. my rock. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And my Amen. church family. Amen. <clears throat> well, it certainly is a lot to be thankful for. And I know the time we're living in, a lot of people call it unprecedented or they call it difficult times. And yes, it's not, not the easiest time in the world right now, but there's so much to be thankful for. And I'm so glad here just to see all the joy. And although all these factors are trying to push us away and keep us out of church and keep us from being happy, we're still full of joy. We're still full of the grace that God gives us. Amen. So today I'm going to talk about um, God willing, maybe he'll change my mind. Um, maybe everything I wrote down, he'll say, that's not what I want you to say. But <laughs> what I think he's called me to say today is um, that life, life is one of the things that he gives us. And life, yes, in the sense of we're all living, but more than that. So we'll dive into that. Um, if you will, if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 1. And while you're turning, I'm going to read one verse out of Psalms 139. It's Psalms 139, verse 14. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Life is a wonderful thing. Each living being is unique. God wonderfully made us. We're all unique individuals. We all have gifts that he's given us. That's something we can praise him and be thankful for. So while you're here in Genesis, if you will, please look at... Um, verse 27. Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created him, he them. We're made in God's image, and that's another thing to be thankful for, that God, he, he's given us some of the things, some of the qualities like him. Um, the joy that he has, we can share that. And we know that by being created in his image, we have the opportunity <coughs> to have a relationship. He didn't make us to be separate individuals. He didn't make us to be isolated from him. He made us to have a union with him. That's why he sent Christ. So how does God give us life? Uh, one, he gives it to us directly. It's still in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So here you see the first thing God creates. He creates light. In, a, in an earth that's void, there's darkness, and it's really beyond human comprehension. 
people come up with all these theories. Well, this is what I think God, the world was like. Or certainly there is no God because how could there, how could there be a time when there was nothing? Well, right here it tells us that there was nothing, and we know the the word of the Lord is true. But God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. So we know if He can create light, if He can create um, the world when there's nothing, when it's just void, we know He can create us. So um, one thing in Genesis chapter 1 is when God says something, that thing comes true. If he says, you know, let there be light, light comes into existence. And still in Genesis this time in chapter 2, and I'd like to give a warning. I've been known to scatter all throughout the Bible, so I'll let you know ahead of time when we're about to turn. Genesis 2 verse 7 it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God gave us directly, he gave us life. He breathed the breath of life into us. So we know life comes from God. But um, another way he gives us life is through his followers. So I have an Old Testament example in 1 Kings chapter 17. And while we're turning, just consider how amazing it is that God gave us a living soul. And what all that entails, not only does it mean we have the opportunity to forge our own paths, but we have that free will where we can go do what we want, but we can also trust in God and we can sacrifice for him. Because he sure has sacrificed a lot for us. Amen. 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 First Kings chapter 17, uh, verses 21 and 22. And this here is, um, is through the prophet Elijah. And it says, He stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So it's not just, uh, not just God who has the power to give other people life. His followers, those who have the Holy Spirit, and this is in the Old Testament, but we know that God gave Elijah power because of Elijah's faith. Elijah knew God can do this, and even though this widow's son here had passed away, he knew he had faith that God could restore his life. And um, it even says he cried unto the Lord. The disciples of Christ, we have to communicate with God. Amen. We can't just we can't just accept Him and then say. Oh, I'm a follower of Christ. I can go do what I want. Like when the disciples said, like, they were so excited they had the power to cast out demons. And Christ said, sure, that's fine, but look at all these other things you can do through, through me and all the glory you can bring, all the people you can reach out to and you can witness to. It's not just power for our own sake. It's power for the glory of God. Amen. And also, um, it stuck out to me. Elijah said, let this child's soul come into him again. God restores life. Um, and for us, this is surrendering to Christ. When we, we, we're sinful beings, so we have this disconnect with God. But when we surrender to Christ, we receive forgiveness, but also our soul comes back into us um, in the form of eternal life. It's not just the situation of we die and that's the, that's the end of the story. That's Kind of the beginning because we know where our soul is going to go when we trust in God. Amen. And also, um, it says in verse 22, the Lord heard. God listens when we call out to him. It's not just a situation where we're talking to ourselves. It's not just a situation of one-way communication. We talk to God, God talks to us. And sometimes it doesn't have to come in the physical form of, oh, I heard God say this. But you can feel it in your heart. If you tru truly are a Christian, you truly accepted him, you can hear it in your heart. You communicate to him through prayer. You read his word. That's how you communicate with God. And then another example, um, this one more recent, is in Acts 20. Acts 20. Verses, um, starting at verse 6. Now we see who Paul, an disciple, an apostle, excuse me, Paul the apostle, what he does when faced with uh, another's death. Acts 20, verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, 
and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eticus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for life is in him. Now it clearly says in verse 9, he was taken up dead. So how is it the very next verse, Paul says, life is in him? Well, it's pretty clear. Paul had faith that God could restore his life. Amen. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of Christ, Paul was able to revive, revive the young man. And like I said, that wasn't Paul. That wasn't Paul suddenly with the power to do whatever he wanted to. It wasn't Paul some uh, supernatural being or Paul some larger-than-life person. But Paul, who trusted in God, Paul, the true apostle, true disciple, who truly believed and walked in the ways of Christ, and he was able to do this. Through Paul, God was able to restore life to this young man. And um, I like to look at symbolism, not exactly in everything, but here um, it says in verse 9 that he, uh, he's taken up in a deep, he was in a deep sleep. So throughout the Bible, sleep often refers to death. Sometimes we're referred to as, before accepting Christ, we're kind of in a deep sleep. We're just walking through life, um, just kind of eat, sleep, going by, no real purpose. But when we have Christ, that's when we awake. That's when we get that new life. Amen. Amen. And um, it says life is in him in verse 10. God has control over life and death. Even fatal occurrences are not enough to stop God's power. And miracles do happen. That's why we continue to pray. If miracles stopped with the New Testament, if miracles stopped 2,000 years ago, then what would this be all about? But clearly, we continue to pray. We continue to bring our, our request to God. And part of our fellowship with the church is that together we can pray. And we see Christ carry out those miracles. Again, it's not us. It's not, oh, we have 10 people all asking for the same thing. Or, oh, everybody on the planet wants the same thing. But it's we're actually communicating with Christ. We're actually bringing our request to him. It's through his power this happens. So why does it matter where life comes from? Well, that's kind of a philosophical question that people have been trying to answer throughout human history. But what does the Bible say about it? One, the fact that God created us in all life and matter proves his control over all. He is who he says he is, and nothing we can make comes close to the level of God's creation. It is comforting to know that our Savior holds the world in his hands. And two, if you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you know that he will restore your relationship with God and grant you eternal life. So one thing to consider here is that life isn't just, like I said, um, eating, sleeping, drinking, going through the motions, but life is about the interactions, the relationships you form, and most importantly, the relationship you have with Christ. Amen. So, what is Jesus? We've, we've heard an Old Testament prophet, a New Testament apostle, but what does Jesus say about life? And what power does Jesus have over life? Let's look at John chapter 14. We're going to see some words written in red. Just John. John 14. Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the life. Our connection to Christ is just as important as life itself. Jesus is the source of all life, and without him, living is temporary. And I also think it's important to see, he doesn't, he doesn't just say, I am the life, but he also says he's the way and the truth. So through Christ, he is the way to the Father. The truth is in him that he is the Son of God, and he is life itself. He is the source of all of our life. We come to him, and yes, we're organisms, we're living, we're alive right now, but spiritually we're dead. We come to Christ, and we get that life. And um, in just a moment, we'll look at some more examples of that. So we know that life comes from God, and that our relationship with Christ gives us spiritual life. Now what? 
Well, in Luke 12, 48, you don't have to turn here, but it says, For unto whomsoever much is, much is given, of him shall be much required. So this tells us, God's given us a lot. So what's the next step? Well, we have to use those gifts he's given us. Amen. And it even says in the Bible, if you don't use those gifts, he can take them away. But we're called to do something greater, to serve a greater purpose than just ourselves. We have been given a great gift in eternal life. Jesus has called us to do things with that gift. One thing he's told us to do, tell others about salvation. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. So right here, one of the first things that Jesus said, or one of the last things, excuse me, that Jesus says before he ascends to heaven after the resurrection. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. More words written in red. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We'll receive power. And that power is not for us to use for our own sake, but rather it's power we're given to help us. Those are tools in the Holy Spirit. Those are things that we utilize in our walk with Christ that help us testify before others. They help us get through those struggles. And honestly, I mean, it's pretty awkward, I would say, to go up to someone just randomly, someone you don't know, and have a full-blown conversation on why you think that they should accept Christ. That seems, from the fleshly perspective, that's awkward. Or it may be hard to do if, if you're an introvert or you don't like to speak publicly. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome that fear. Or we can overcome persecution. Maybe it's not just, oh, we're afraid of what people say about us, but maybe people are actually trying to stop our mission, our call. And the Holy Spirit gives us the courage to overcome that. And the Holy Spirit creates paths, avenues for us to reach people we never thought we could reach. Um... The power of the Holy Ghost helps us endure the struggles, but also witness boldly before others. And when Jesus mentions, he mentions Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's not just saying you have to go to Kazakhstan or China or Zimbabwe or Brazil. It's saying you can, you can be a missionary right where you live. You can reach others right where you are. And it doesn't have to be strangers. It can be your friends and family. And we're called to, to reach those people. No matter how hard it is, that's what our, we're supposed to do. And I've fallen short, and I'm sure many other people have fallen short, but that's what we're called to do. And we're supposed to use that Holy Ghost to reach the people around us. But it also says the uttermost parts of the earth, if you feel led to be a missionary, then God's looking out for you. And maybe, maybe you'll be killed for your faith or imprisoned. Or maybe you'll be destitute, poor, having to beg to survive. But with the power of the Holy Ghost, you can overcome that. And you're promised to have your life in heaven. But even if you're not a missionary, you can witness where you are. But also you can support missionaries. You can be active in the church. You can, you can give. And that's why I believe offering is important. But another thing you can do is... Telling others about salvation, that's a thing you do connecting with other people. That's kind of um, an outside of you kind of thing. But an inside of you thing will be sanctification. Continue to be sanctified. Paul writes about that in Hebrews chapter 2. And I said Paul. Um, technically, the author of Hebrews is disputed, but I believe it was Paul. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. Mm. What does it mean here, all of one? Well, that's a union with Christ. The one who, who sanctifies and they who are sanctified. Well, the one who sanctifies is, is Christ. He's calling us to come closer to him. And we are the ones who are being sanctified. We're, we're supposed to be on that walk, getting closer to him. And in our relationship, we have a union. We are one with Christ. And that doesn't mean we're not going to sin. It doesn't mean we're not going to have any problems or that life is going to be scotch-free easy. But it does mean that we have Christ to rely on, to count on. And 
he's that model for us to strive to follow. We're to become more like Jesus every day. It's an everyday call. There is always something we can do to become less sinful and more Christ-like. Sanctification is important because it helps Christians stay on the right path as well as build reputable testimonies. Again, that goes back to witnessing. When you as an individual or you as a church grow closer to Christ, that helps your witness. That helps your testimony. So even though it seems difficult at times to go reach people, friends, family, strangers, people across the globe, we know that we have become more like Christ and we can overcome those obstacles. And now finally, um, last two passages will be back in John. John chapter 3. Um, starting with verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, a, have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. As I said earlier, this connects with the claim, all life comes from God. And really I say it's a claim, but that's the truth. All life comes from God. Right here it says that who's, those who believe won't perish, they'll have eternal life. And that's so comforting to know that all of our work here is not in vain. All of our efforts, all the struggles we put to further the name of Christ and to give him glory, they'll be rewarded one day. And we're not just supposed to do that because, oh, we're going to heaven, so I guess I should do that. But no, it should be more than an obligation. It should be a joy. It should be something we look forward to every day to further the name of Christ and to strengthen our faith. And some days are, are harder than others. But to know it's not a benchmark. It's not... I woke up today, I'm as close to Christ as I'll ever be, but every day working and continuing to grow, just the joy that comes from that is unimaginable. And it says God loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So he gave his son so that we could have life. And that's one thing I know with the testimonies that everybody said they were so thankful for that. I'm thankful for that too, that Jesus would come, live a perfect life, do nothing wrong and he died for me so that I won't have to go to hell and that's just such a, a joyous thing and then one thing that Jesus says to someone else is in John chapter 4 the last passage John chapter 4 verses 13 and 14 Jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is more than just food, oxygen, water. The life he gives is more than just what we have on this earth. It's a connection with God. It's a power to overcome the world's struggles. And it's an eternity in paradise. What we get from him satisfies our hunger, our thirst for purpose, um, for something greater than ourselves. We know one day we're all gonna pass away and we'll leave a legacy, but that legacy doesn't matter. All the awards that we win, all the friends that we have, really those things will be forgotten. But with Christ, our connection with Christ and those who we tell about him, those who we pray for, those who we work with in order to further his, his claim, his, his name, excuse me, those are the things that will last forever. And even if the world forgets about it, still, while the world passes away, the word of God will remain intact. Amen. I thank you for listening. Amen. If, if you don't know Christ and you want a further connection with him, if you want that everlasting life, feel free to come to the altar and pray. And come talk to me. I'll be happy to talk with you. Thank you.